Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Thursday, the 18th of April, 2013, and our special guests are Posse Salberg and Vivian Stewart. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a special show. It's in conjunction with the Asia Society uh, and the Partnership for Global Learning. Thanks to Asia Society and thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for the use of this virtual room. We have a number of worldwide virtual conferences taking place this year. These are all free. Uh, they are supported by organizations, but they provide an opportunity for very unique peer-to-peer -peer professional development. We had the School Leadership Summit in March. All of those recordings are up. It's a full day of uh, about 70 sessions and some great keynotes. Coming up in at the end of June at, at the Physical ISTE Conference, we have our shadow conference events called ISTE Unplugged that starts with an all-day unconference called Hack Education this year. And then this summer, we have a um, a fairly significant event that Hewlett Packard is sponsoring on STEM, a worldwide STEM conference. Then in the fall, our Future of Libraries conference and the what we call the Mothership, the five-day global education conference, which is five days, 24 hours a day. These are really fun events. Go to web20labs.com to find out more about them. Coming up on this interview series, uh, next week, Jim Popham talks to us about uh, mismeasurement and the truth about testing. Uh, Andreas Schleicher uh, on the 25th as part of this Asia Society series on what we can learn about learning from data. On May 8th, John Hunter comes back to talk about world peace and other fourth grade achievements. Uh, great TED talk that is now a book just coming out and John will return to talk about that. Peter Gray on his new book, Free to Learn, and much more coming up, hopefully something that is of interest to you to join us. All of these shows are recorded in full Blackboard Collaborate form and in MV3 versions. Elliot Washer and Charles Majowski talked to us yesterday about their new book, Leaving to Learn, from Big Picture of Learning. That was fascinating. Madeline, Madeline Levine on um, parenting and John Hattie on meta, meta studies and education. Michael Fullen before that, Young Zhao. Anyway, lots up there, over 350 sessions, I think, at this point. Again, uh, available for you to download and listen to. Those of you who are in the studio audience now get a chance to let us know where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. Click on it twice, and then click on the map. It's fun if you put the time and the temperature. Now we've got New Zealand. I'm in Jaipur, India. And it's 1.33 in the morning, and it's been hot, which should be no surprise to anybody. North America, Canada, the United States. Feel free to continue to put those notes in the chat as we move forward. There is a Mighty Bell space for this show. It's a place where you can continue the conversation. I've put several links up on that site if you want to follow up on the material. The link is there in the chat. It's also in my blog post. And um, feel free to participate in that after the show. So Vivian, I, I, I want to jump right in. An hour seems like a lot of time, but it turns out not to be. And there are two of you, and you're both so interesting to that we'll want to hear from. Um, can you kind of give us an overview of what the international tests are showing us, sort of how we should be perceiving the results of these tests in the United States? Well, if you're trying to compare education systems internationally, there are a number of things to look at, not all of which are in the international test. But um, you certainly would want to look at high school graduation rates, because that's really sort of a basic entry point uh, for a modern economy. Um, you'd also want to look at college going entry and exit rates, um, because that tells you, you know, what your high school uh, level is. Um, but when people, so those things are important, but when people talk about international tests, they are usually talking about a set of tests. There's um, 
uh, Pearls, which is a literacy test, TIMS, which is a science test, and the most, I think, well-known, the PISA test, <clears throat> are tests of what 15-year-olds know in math, science, and reading. Um, and all of those things together, they have slightly different results, but if you take all of those things together, they do show that certain countries are significantly um, sort of ahead of the pack, if you like, in terms of the, the level of student performance and graduation from school and college. Um, others are in the middle and, and others are low down. There's not a huge difference between, say, number 14 and number 15 on the list, but between the top and the middle and the bottom, there's a big range, and there's a lot of research that shows that this has sort of consequences, um, at least in the, in, the, in the economy. Has the United States actually um, performed more poorly, or is it just that the other countries are doing better? Um, the other countries are doing better. In the 20th century, the U.S. was the first country in the world to get sort of mass secondary education. We still are not 100%, but we have mass secondary education. The first country in the world to have mass higher education. Um, other countries noticed this and saw that it was important to U.S. success in the sort of latter half of the 20th century, and they, so they started to invest in education, and they have been moving ahead much more rapidly. So we haven't got worse, um, but other countries have got better faster, and so relatively speaking, uh, we are behind in terms of the skill levels of our labor force. So Posse, uh, Vivian, um comes up with eight sets of um, solutions or conclusions uh, about things that the United States uh, could or should be doing uh, in order to, or lessons that we could learn from these countries, one of which is uh, around equity. Can you define equity for us and sort of give us an understanding of how that's a part of the Finnish story? Uh, sure, Steve, but let me begin by congratulating you and the Asia Society for a wonderful forum for people around the world to join the conversation and, and speak about these important things. Um, you know, first thing I have to say is that I'm, I'm not a native English speaker, so all these concepts and words I have to learn uh, from others. And uh, uh, equity is one of the one of the difficult terms, really, in, in education to define because it's been used in a, in a very different different way. Sometimes when people speak about equity in education, they refer to uh, fiscal equity, meaning that the, uh, the resources would be distributed evenly. Sometimes people use equity as a synonym for equality. Uh, that's often the case here in, in Finland uh, because we really don't have the word equity that we could uh, that we use in, in education. But for me, when I when I speak and write about equity in education here in Finland, um, I often use the definition that, for example, the famous uh, Australian uh, Gonski review recently adopted, which basically says that uh, equity in education is the strength of the relationship between children's family background and their educational performance in school, meaning that if this was an ideal world, then uh, there would be no correlation between children's family background and how well they learn in school because everybody would learn uh, uh, regardless of where they come from, but everybody knows that the family background and parents' socioeconomic status is the the strongest uh, uh, kind of a factor behind the students' uh, learning in school, then equity becomes a relevant term. So in other words, when we speak about more equitable education systems, uh, the strength of the relationship between children's family background and their educational performance gets weaker, and if this relationship is strong, then the education system is said to be um, unequitable. And this has been a really significant part of 
the story you tell about Finland's success, right? It was not the the desire for academic achievement, but the desire for equity. Am I right? Yes, exactly. And this, uh, you know, the story of Finland, as I, I describe it in uh, in my Finnish lessons book, is uh, really the story of the last 40 years. Uh, we we started to build this current school system in 1972, and then, as you said, um, equity was the was the driver for education. So the the goal and dream for this reform was to uh, provide school for each and every child where they can learn well rather than compete against other countries and reach to the to the top of the world and that's sometimes seen as an irony of this Finnish story uh, because um, uh, we have been able to climb high uh, in, in internationally without really paying too much attention to uh, competition, but rather put equity in education as a primary goal. So, Vivian, if I think about this rationally and logically, it makes an enormous amount of sense. You're you're building for a, a longer term success within your culture, society. You're you're investing in a, a broad way in helping all people succeed. Why in the United States do we have difficulty with equity? <coughs> oh, that's a <coughs> excuse me. That's a very large, um, a very large question. Um, I th I think. Um, well, let me just sort of compare the United States on on um, Parsi's definition of equity, which is in equitable systems. There's a weaker relationship between family background and uh, and school performance, and so so the countries that are actually the most successful in the world are achieving that, and they're achieving it in all different ways. The way that Finland achieves it is not as the same as the way that uh, Canada achieves it is not as the same as the way Singapore achieves it, but they all have made that commitment, and they're using a variety of, of strategies, some of them outside the school, family and school support, some of them system-wide policies around funding and distribution of teachers, some of them about early intervention in the school. I mean, these, these are not unknown things. People know the range of things that, that, that affect equity, but, um, but, but they are applying them. The, the, the reason the U.S. does not do, one major reason the U.S. doesn't do well in these international comparisons is that it has such a big group of students at the bottom who are scoring at basic or really below basic um, on what, what um, uh, Worldwide experts think students should know and be able to do at age 15 in uh, in, in these subjects. And so, I mean, we have um, tremendous peaks of excellence, but we also have um, um, great variation uh, in performance. So, you know, if you take one of the reasons there's an interest in uh, promoting uh, common standards across the country is that uh, the standards that students are expected to meet in the US, they, they vary by state, they vary by cities within states, they vary by schools within cities, uh, you know, they can vary by classrooms within schools. Um, and that's, so that's a big part of the problem is that we have basically not expected equity. Um, we also, going along with that, um, do not have equitable financing. We're one of the few countries in the world where financing is so heavily dependent on the local property tax. In most countries, financing is done either at a state or a national level. It's much more equitable. In fact, there's often more funding put behind students with greater needs rather than the other way around that we have. Um, countries uh, try very hard to make sure that there are excellent teachers uh, in all schools. Every country struggles with this because no teacher wants to live in really, really rural areas. Um, but they all sort of focus uh, on that as a, as a matter of policy. Um, so you can look at a whole range of policies that we have or don't have that lead to this great variation in performance. 
um, you know, the larger sort of philosophical and political question is, you know, why, why don't we change those policies to have more equitable performance? I'm interested in the languages of our cultures. And, and it comes up here, Vivian, because I think we tell stories in the United States of opportunity, but we're suspicious of equity. Um, Posse, it also occurs to me that the language that we use in the United States is often kind of negative. So we talk about um, a nation at risk or race to the top or no child left behind versus something like uh, the worth and value of every child or the potential of each student. Is there a way in which you see a language difference that reflects maybe uh, um, some of the barriers that we face culturally? Uh, yes, it may be, may be so. I think what is also different in terms of the um, the discourse in in education policy and education reform as well between the United States and and uh, actually much of the English speaking world and place like Finland is that you um, you adapt many more terms and concepts and models ideas from. Uh, the business world, uh, for example, accountability is one of the one of the good examples where um, Finland we are we are not using account we have the word accountability in our language but we are we are never using it in education because we associate that more to business or corporate world. Uh, in in education we speak more uh, about responsibility when it comes to education or teaching and learning. Uh, in schools, um, I think also the, the difference between use of language between uh, the English-speaking world and and where I live is that you um, seem to rely much on these invented uh, kind of a brands like the No Child Left Behind or the A Nation at Risk that you mentioned, and then. Um, you know, still try to keep on doing the same same old things, and and that's something uh, interesting. For example, the the the, um, the title of the No Child Left Behind is uh, excellent. You know, it's, it's it's actually what we have been doing here for the last 40 years. The Finnish reform could have been uh, labeled or named uh, No Child Left Behind because that's uh, that's really what we have been uh, doing. Um, uh, you know, chasing these these names and bringing in this new uh, kind of a titles uh, every now and then uh, when the new reforms comes come come into the picture. I think it's not necessarily very helpful for the schools because they. Uh, uh, I think most of our schools they probably would like to have a little bit more time to uh, you know understand what the authorities what they mean by these uh, new policies and reforms and then try to work on this. But unfortunately. Not only that, the terms that we use in uh, our language uh, when we speak about education change, but also these big ideas that they come and go so quickly. That uh, sometimes, when I look around the countries around the world, uh, I conclude that many, many, particularly senior educators, that they have learned uh, that reforms they come and go. That they stay there for four years, or five years, or eight years, and then something new comes, and they. Teachers and principals uh, are not, uh, you know, taking them seriously anymore. I have one comment to the, um, if I if I may, to the equity your equity question in the United States. And you know, if you look at the OECD um, evidence, the OECD data from the PISA database on uh, quality and equity in education, and you uh, you locate the United States as a as a federal uh, state into the uh, this two-dimensional map of equity in education on one axis and quality or excellence of education on the other. Uh, the interesting thing is that the United States is fairly close uh, to the international average in both of these variables. And the, whenever I speak about this in the United States, I often always want to show this picture because it's a, always a surprise at least to my audience, is to see that um, that the United States is not actually doing that bad in in uh, in terms of equity. At least if it's uh, 
if we if we believe what the OECD is doing. So I, I think we also need to, uh, at the same time, when we say that there's a, the equity is a challenge for the United States, but as an external observer of the complexity and diversity of education in the United States, you know, my conclusion is that the public education system in America is doing actually surprisingly well in terms of, uh, particularly in terms of equity. Um, and, and that's why I think uh, I just want to give some some credit also to the people who have been maintaining and sustaining the public school system there. I think that if, uh, if I may come in on that, I, I don't know that we want to get into a sort of technical debate about the, the OECD <coughs> data because it does. There are different ways of slicing it, <coughs> but certainly if you look at the proportion, the, the proportion of students scoring in the bottom two of the six. Um, bands of measurement, it's very high. Now, there are a lot of different countries in the, P in the PISA surveys. It's actually gone beyond OECD. Lots of countries outside of OECD now take it, and many of them um, are at lesser stages of development. There are clearly countries that are more inequitable than the U.S., but, but it's, still the, it's still the case that one reason the U.S. average performance is low is because we have such a large proportion of students who are not uh, performing um, very well. Um, and if we may, just on the issue of leadership and language, that's a very interesting point you raise about the, the language in which uh, education is discussed, and I, I guess in the U.S. I'd say, you know, if you, in a local school, people talk about, uh, you know, the goals for children, the aspirations for children, in, a, in I think a fairly positive way. It's when you get to the, the state and national policy discussions that you get this focus on, on sort of crisis, and and it is noticeable. I, I don't know that I could generalize about all countries in the world, but I spend a lot of time in Asia, and we bring together U.S. and Asian educators for discussions of sort of common educational issues. And, and the discourse from Asian countries, we're all talking about the challenges facing us, but the American um, discourse is much more negative about how poorly we're doing, whereas the Asian discourse is much more a sort of onward and upward story of, um, of progress, so that's interesting. But I, I do think, um, Asi talked about reforms coming and going and people uh, getting tired of them, believing they'll, they'll, they'll blow over. Another aspect of countries that are doing well is that they do find a way to have sustained leadership in education over long periods yeah. of time. I mean, often educational change comes out of a crisis and there might be a strong leader and you can get, you can, you can create some significant change in three or four years. But the really long-term changes go beyond um, a sort of typical political cycle. Um, and so the question is, how can you get a commitment to um, a path that's reasonably consistent, where one builds on the other, over enough time for the system to uh, to keep moving up? Parsi can talk about how it's done in, in, in Finland. I mean, in some countries where you know, there's only one party, one political party, you obviously get it that way. But um, in other places, and I think um, Ontario in Canada is a good example of this. In the 1990s, they had a really dysfunctional system. The Everybody was fighting with everybody else. There was lots of... Uh, uh, blaming the teachers, very much the kind of rhetoric we've had in the U.S. over the last couple of years. Lots of teachers were leaving the profession. When a new uh, premier came in in the early 2000s, he decided to bring all of the stakeholders in education together and create what he called a partnership table. Um, and had them all agree on a, on a limited number of goals in literacy, math, and high school graduation that they were going to work on. Um, because he wanted to be sure that whatever he launched while he was in office continued uh, for, for enough years. So there has to be a way to create that kind of broad consensus uh, so that you're not just you know, in the situation where every time there's a new governor, there's a new uh, education initiative that repudiates the previous one. So we've talked about equity, and, and you did a very nice job there, I think, talking about vision and leadership. Uh, and, and we're not going to be able to get through all eight lessons in, in full detail. But I did also want to make sure that we talked about, uh, Vivian, your lesson of high quality teachers and leaders. Um, and, and you write that the quality of teachers depends on the system in place to support them. So what lessons have you learned about that? 
Mm-hmm. Um, well, and Finland is a great example, so I'm sure Parsi will, t- will talk about that. Um, so there have now been three uh, international summits on the teaching profession. Mm-hmm. Uh, which have brought together 20 to 25 countries with somebody from the ministry and somebody from the teachers' organization, usually a union, but not always, um, to focus on the issue of uh, the teaching profession in the 21st century. Because I think every country has concluded that no matter what your policy structures, um, it really all depends on the quality of the teacher in the classroom. And I would say if you put together the lessons sort of across all of those, of those countries, um, and I've written the reports from these summits, so that's sort of topmost in my mind, you, there's a, to get a high quality teaching profession, you need to do a number of things. Uh, not every country does all of these things, but you certainly need to make teaching an attractive profession. Um, starting uh, at the very beginning by trying to recruit into teaching uh, people who are of high academic quality and also really, really want to teach, have a passion about children. Um, You want to give them strong preparation in subject matter, but also a lot of of, uh, clinical preparation in classrooms. I think that's the biggest weakness most countries would say of their teacher preparation system is that teachers don't have enough uh, mentored experience in classrooms. Um, The best systems also make sure that new teachers are not just thrown into the deep end. Um, but have some real sort of mentoring over the first couple of years. And there are enormous differences in the attrition rates of teachers from 3% in the best system to um, up to 50% in some American cities, for example. So so the mentoring really is important. Um, in many systems, I, I think Finland is, is, is different in this respect, um, there's, there's also been an attempt to create career paths for teachers so that it isn't a flat profession for 30 years, but so that, that your most talented teachers get the opportunity for leadership roles in the schools, um, often with associated salary increases or title increases, and then their role becomes to work with younger teachers to improve the instruction. Um, in schools, um, so that, so it, it's a sort of a, you know beginning to end of career um, approach to um, getting the best possible people you can get into into every classroom. Um, it's not just picking on one or two things like well we should do something about teacher preparation or we should institute a new teacher evaluation system. Those things just doing one or two things on their own doesn't doesn't seem to work. I see there's so much that's said about Finland's uh, teachers and you've done a great job in communicating this. As I was sort of reviewing this material, something occurred to me and I'm, I'm wondering if it makes any sense to you. It felt to me like there was this tremendous parallel between how teachers are treated in the Finnish system and how students are treated. That, that both are sort of trusted and treated as adults with the potential to achieve. Is that a fair parallel that I'm drawing? Um, I think you're right, Steve. Um, and and that's, that's what we often hear from, uh, from the international visitors that we have. We have had here to the point that our Ministry of Education has considered changing the name of the Ministry of Education and Culture to Ministry of Education and Tourism. So, but this, you know, this tourism has really also helped us to see things like you mentioned. Um, and I think, um, I, I think the, the kind of a uh, theory of action of many Finnish educators and teachers is that um, the similar similar type of conditions for productive learning. Uh, and behavior really uh, must exist in both classrooms and uh, and staff rooms. In other words, that the the pupils and students must be treated in the same uh, respect and dignity as uh, teachers want them to be treated by the society. And uh, and I I think that is kind of a cultural uh, unity in a way within our education system is one of the um, one of the peculiar features of, uh, uh, of Finnish school. Many people who come here, they expect to see 
uh, kind of a strict order and discipline and uh, uh, sort of a power teaching by very effective and uh, active teachers. Uh, but what they, what many people see here is uh, quite the opposite. They, they see a relaxed uh, atmosphere in schools and, uh, you know, not too many busy people or kind of a stopwatch type of pedagogy, but uh, kind of a relaxed uh, atmosphere. And I think that this goes through both uh, students and uh, teachers as well. I'm so glad you brought that up because, Vivian, when we talk about accountability in the United States, we get visions of stress and control and compliance that come to mind. But the, the description Posse just gave of kind of relaxed, engaged, deep learning actually can be a part of long-term accountability. How have you kind of parsed that out? Um, well, I think in, in Finland, let me comment on Finland and then talk about some other countries. I think when a country has great confidence and great respect in its teachers, as Finland does, I mean, only I think it's only 10% of the people who apply to become teachers in Finland can become teachers. It's a highly selective occupation. Um, then you don't have to have a lot of managerial mechanisms. Um, uh, to regulate them and measure what they're doing. The schools in Finland are also very small, so everything can be more informal. Um, I think where you see accountability pressures come in is in countries where they feel their education systems are not performing well, um, or um, so, so they look at student data and see problems and the first instinct is to you know, put, sort of to monitor it more, um, uh, or if they don't have confidence in all the teachers, and so you know one press for accountability systems for teachers is because there's a sense that some teachers are ineffective. Um, but I, I think um, so. There is this great tension actually. The, the most recent international summit on the teaching profession, which was held in Amsterdam in March, was on this subject of um, uh, accountability systems for teachers. And you will find, again, a great range of practice. Um, there are systems, and Singapore would be an example, where there's, uh, I mean, they have an extremely high quality teacher workforce. They've done all the things I talked about uh, earlier. Starting in the mid-90s, they decided to raise the quality of the, of, of the teaching profession, did a lot of things to do that. But they, they still have, um, uh, uh, quite organized and systematic forms of, of accountability uh, in the system, both of schools. They're measured every year in terms of whether they are meeting the goals that the principal has set. Uh, teachers make a plan at the beginning of the year, and they meet the principal twice during the year, and they are assessed at the end of the year by peer teachers. But they're assessed on a wide range of measures. They're assessed. Um, on not just how well they are teaching in the classroom, but how well they relate to students and parents, what professional contribution they make to the school. So it's a sort of multifaceted effort. But then based on that, um, a professional development plan is set for the next year. Um, they set it that they will work on. So you can, you can see systems in, in which accountability is part of a much larger system, sort of continuous improvement system. That would be sort of an ideal if you're going to have an accountability system, which I think most countries will have, because they don't necessarily, they're not small and they don't have necessarily the level of trust in the society that characterizes Finland. But then there are places in the US and many Western European countries um, uh, are examples where there's um, you know, just tr tremendous fights over accountability because it is being it's seen as being applied in a sort of a harsh or a punitive sense or measuring on very narrow measures and you know making high stakes decisions on um, kinds of uh, assessments that really don't don't bear that weight um, so I, w I would say overall I, I, I think the, the teachers organizations the international teachers organizations as they participate in this conversation are trying to stress that um, everybody 
that feedback is useful for everybody, um, but that I'm just trying to turn off my phone here. Um, but that it needs to be it needs to be tied to improvement and opportunities for professional development, rather, which is a more sort of professional way uh, of thinking about accountability, rather than a very managerial, top down uh, as as a party says a very business oriented view of accountability. Steve, can I get back to the? Uh, yeah, I'd like to get back to to Vivian's um, uh, point on um, the situation in Finland, which is. Uh, which is very correct, but this is so important that I want to um, uh, echo it a little bit. Um, it's true uh, when you said, Vivian, that we are accepting about one of uh, every ten candidates, applicants, into primary school teacher education programs, which um, simply means that when the, our research universities are choosing these um, students into their master's degree, programs that normally last for five, five to six years, that they can really select the, uh, those individuals who are both able and, um, and morally committed to uh, work as, as teachers for their life. And, and, but this, you know, this means uh, here in Finland that we can, when we have this uh, privilege to control the quality of teachers at entry, in other words, that we are not uh, allowing anybody even to begin studying to be a teacher uh, in Finland, let alone that we would be, uh, you know, allowing people to go into school uh, with a low moral or low skills. Um, we don't need to really ask ourselves about the accountability or teacher effectiveness or anything like this because all of those who are accepted, lucky enough to get through into teacher training, they also graduate, and most of them will go and enroll into school and, and work there uh, for a long time. And that's why uh, I was there in Amsterdam with you in this summit, and uh, I was not part of the Finnish uh, delegation, uh, and, but I had a chance to to speak with my colleagues there from Finland, and they kind of a informal overall uh, impression of the meeting was that they didn't quite understand why people spend so much speaking about these things that you mentioned uh, about you know measuring teachers and uh, you know trying to find the definition of uh, for a effective teacher and uh, all this talk about accountability how and, and uh, in which ways the teachers should be held accountable for what they do. You know, these Finnish teachers and educators' uh, reaction was that they, 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 they were kind of a surprise that people even speak about these things because it's, uh, it's something that is, uh, is a very kind of a different thing in, in, uh, in Finland because of these things. And that's why I think, you know, people often misunderstand uh, the issue of trust in uh, when they come to Finland. They, most people, when they leave uh, our country after one week visiting schools and talking to teachers, they say that the most impressive thing that they they uh, take with them is uh, is trust that they that they saw in schools and classrooms. But you know, the trust is a, in a way it's a consequence of this situation that I described that we have. Uh, highly talented and motivated young people who are, who compete over uh, study places in our research universities, and when they uh, graduate and go and work in a school, it's a little bit same as somebody working in a medical clinic or a law office uh, with a highly respected uh, academic degree. That we rarely question uh, our own doctors or dentists. Uh, skills or commitment to work uh, and it's, it's a pretty much the same thing with teachers because they have to go through uh, kind of a equally tough competition to get there. So that's why I think the, the, the Finnish situation is in, in terms of teachers it's often kind of a s simplified uh, or, or presented in a two s kind of a simple simple way. Trust is important but also the uh, you know the privilege that we have to uh, you know, carefully select and, and emphasize the, the qualities and characteristics of young people that we want, uh, of those who will be trained to be teachers, is very unique. 
I want to cover two more of uh, your lessons Vivian. The first one is student motivation. And, and I want to take a slightly different approach here. When Posse talks about committing to equity and then having the natural consequence of that be a good learning, it seems like there's a very interesting kind of larger philosophical moral lesson there. Um, as I read the section on student motivation and, and was thinking about a lot of the ways in which we talk about education, I wondered how you manage the balance between society determining some needs that it has and, and trying to implement those in education versus a society which looks to build up students and then believes that there would be a positive outcome from that. So much of the dialogue seems to be around what society needs. How, did you, how do you manage that balance yourself personally between thinking about society's needs and the individual's needs? Um, that's, that's a very good question. And, and Steve, I should just say for whoever's listening, I mean, Parsi is talking about one, one system. And um, in my book, I look at a half a dozen very, very different systems. <laughs> so um, these lessons learned are lessons that I think cut across systems that are very, very different from um, sort of federal systems like Canada and Australia that are sort of much closer to the US that are higher performing uh, to Asian systems like Singapore and China that are obviously organized uh, uh, very differently. Um, uh, I, I devote some time to Finland as well. Um, so I, the, I, I'm sort of generalizing across. And the reason for looking across very, very different systems is to see what, it, what makes systems high performing, even if they have different cultures, even if they have different political systems, um, different ethnic mixes, different economic levels, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I just want to say that because um, um, sometimes it, you know, if you're talking about the US, if you're talking about one country, it may not, may not, be, as, may not be true of others on, on a specific point, but, it, but at, a high, at a high level. Um, so I, I, I think I have been uh, in looking at, at, at systems because the question is, you know, why is the US uh, not performing well or, or the other way around? How do high performing systems become that way? What are some of the common elements that drive systems towards higher performance? I am looking at it pr from a societal uh, point of view. Um, but I think, um, I mean, one of the strengths of the U.S., at least in its better schools, I wouldn't say it's true of all schools, is this focus on uh, the, the needs of individual students. Um, uh, just last week, uh, we held a conference with uh, the U.S. Department of Education and the State Commissioners of Education at Harvard of nine uh, directors of education from provinces in China and their sort of equivalent state commissioners from, from the US. And they together visited some schools in Boston. And one of the things that struck uh, these Chinese educators um, was not only the diversity of the schools, um, the ethnic and linguistic diversity of the schools in Boston, but how much the teachers in those schools, now these were successful schools, um, but, but with low, low income students, um, how much they paid attention to the individual needs of students, um, and how much the interaction and the discussion seemed to be about finding each student's interest and, and, and moving them along. And that is, that is, I think, is very different from the, 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 uh, the, the Asian systems, which have a very well-structured system that you know, leads towards examinations and, and sort of the, the student has to fit into that. Now, there are, there are plenty of people who would say, well, this, the same is true in the US. I mean, that um, you know, w once you get to high school, you, the, the things are much more organized around subject matter and university entrance. It's not so much about um, uh, finding individuals' passions and, and motivations. So I think every education system struggles with those. I, I think Finland is you know, at, at sort of one end where it's very, very individualized um, and um, you know, about the individual student's interest. And um, you know, some of the Asian systems may be at the other, and the US is somewhere in between, but does have a strong element of 
um, attention to individual needs. One of the reasons we have you know, we have a broad curriculum and lots of extracurricular activities. Um, you know, some people think the breadth of the curriculum again is one reason why our standards in the core subjects may not may not be so high. But on the other hand, it gives students many more opportunities to find their own interests. Pasi, how do you respond to that um, kind of tension between the needs of the society and the needs of the students? Um, yeah, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question, but I think Vivian already said this, uh, uh, that it's a kind of a basic philosophy of Finnish, uh, um, especially compulsory education that lasts from age 7 to 16, so we are speaking about the nine years of, of schooling, that it's a very, in, very, very individualized, meaning that the, uh, the education uh, must be organized according to the needs of of every child, and that's why the, also the goal of education, the basic education in Finland, is to, um, you know, try to upbring and enhance each and every individual's um, capac capacities and potential to um, continue their studies or um, or work afterwards. So, um, I think in the basic education we have a very uh, individualized approach to education and this leaves a lot of uh, space also for Finnish schools to set their own standards and and, and goals. We have a system uh, at the moment in our schools where every school will uh, design their own curriculum and set the standards and uh, expectations based on the national rather loose framework. Uh, so it leaves a lot of uh, freedom for communities and uh, schools really to, uh, you know, see what is the best thing for for their children wherever they are in Finland. Situation changes a little bit when uh, when our pupils continue studies studying in the upper secondary schools. Uh, normally they are about 16 years old when they when they do that, and there we have because we have two types of. Uh, uh, upper secondary schools, a vocational school, uh, where approximately half of the students uh, at that age go, is very much driven by the uh, by the needs of the labor market and economy, and the the academic upper secondary school is more uh, driven by the expectations of further education or academic higher education. So, I would say that we try to educate our all our children up to the age of uh, 16 uh, based on the very individualized and uh, child-centered uh, educational philosophy where a kind of a balanced uh, curriculum is a, is a kind of a defining idea in our schools. We try to keep a good balance with uh, music, drama, dance, uh, manual uh, work and the academic subjects so that everybody can find their own passion and area of, of strength. But as I say, that they, when they get older, the situation changes. So I want, go ahead. Then when, you pose the question, when you pose the question that way, Steve, um, I, I think you're perhaps primarily talking about the sort of the economic function of education, of producing a skilled labor force, at least that was the, the way I, I took your question, and that's obviously from a society point of view a major one. But um, another um, value of or goal that societies put on their education systems is also to produce good mm -hmm. citizens. Um, <clears throat> that's not something that's captured in any of these uh, international measuring systems. Um, I think probably because it's 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 too context dependent. It's it's too um, it's too hard to measure. But it's certainly something as you as you look at all of the the documents about different countries' educational systems. It's certainly something that um, uh, countries place great uh, stress on. And uh, and the, the and the ideas about what it is to be a good citizen are changing and becoming not just you know somebody who who will serve a local community. Um, that was perhaps an older definition, but you know somebody who can be a good citizen in their nation, but also increasingly the idea of global citizenship um, is sort of entering uh, the, the, the discourse of these of these countries. This is a perfect segue because I want to make sure that we do touch on the global and future orientation lesson. 
So Vivian, um, I was an exchange student in high school. I lived in Brazil for a year. And so I kind of take notice of the, the information on the exchange programs. And Ed uh, Gregert recently said that um, in the US, we receive about 20,000 exchange students a year, but we send out fewer than 2,000. Is there something valuable in understanding that? Is there a way to explain why we um, aren't more globally minded? Uh, well, I don't know what um, Ed probably knows because he's been in that field a long time. Is, is he talking about high school students or college students? Yeah, that was high school I mean, students, the I believe. Of college students. Yeah, the numbers of college students who are, who are studying. High, exchange at the high school level is still quite small, I think, in most places. At the college level, it's much more substantial. And um, while the US certainly receives more students from other countries than it, than it sends out, um, uh, it's it's definitely growing there, and that's that's a big focus at the higher education level. I I, I think um, people, for a whole variety of reasons, um, uh, maybe don't emphasize it so much at the um, at the high school level. But but on the issue of um, why why the U.S. isn't more global, um, you know, I, I think it's for good historical reasons. I mean the. European countries are small and they interact with each other. Uh, countries that were colonized learned about you know, the imperial uh, country. The, the US was a huge continental country with a big domestic labor market, oceans around it that protected it uh, from the world, a very local system of school governance, so you tend to emphasize local, local issues. So I, I think it's, it's understandable why it was that way in the past. Um, you know, the question is, what's, what's it going to be uh, like in the future? And certainly, as you look at other countries' education systems, I, I think, um, I, I don't know how, how Finland would, would rank on this, but um, you know, world geography, world history, learning a second language from elementary school, um, you know, the idea of spending you know, part of your higher education career learning abroad. Um, Singapore even sends its teachers and principals um, to other countries to sort of look at other best practice elsewhere and, and bring it back home. There's, there's a much more global orientation um, in, uh, in, in, in other countries. But I think it's coming here. You, it's, it's increasing. Vivian talks about international benchmarking, Posse. I know I've heard you speak about uh, Finland not wanting to, knowing that there's a need for reinvention, constant reinvention, and not wanting to rest on laurels or even become tied to um, matching previous test scores. In what ways is Finland looking to learn from, continue to learn from international, um, uh, from other countries? Um, you know, of course, the situation where we have been now for the last 11, 12 years uh, during the PISA period has given us this uh, opportunity to meet um, many more people really throughout the world than we have ever had uh, had a chance to do. And, uh, and this is, of course, through the, the, the visitors who come here. I, I think we have had uh, all of the... Uh, the current uh, educational reform uh, thinkers and leaders here, um, several leading policymakers, practitioners, and I think this has provided us an opportunity to, uh, you know, continuously learn from from others. Uh, I, I think it's important to remind here people that uh, the Finnish success where we are now is very much built on the ideas and innovations that we have learned, uh, particularly from the United States uh, uh, during the last 50 years, uh, really, and that's why I think Finns understand it much better than uh, many others, how important, how, how conditional, actually, um, the, um, the learning from others is, meaning that we, we cannot really think about the future without uh, continuing learning from others. My brief comment to the, the question of educating global citizens is that I, I think we really, when we speak about school education, like Vivian said, that we, we, we have to think about other things before we 
uh, ask the question of how many students go to exchange in before the college. And, and global education, global citizenship education is uh, much more than that. It's, uh, it's really, like, like you heard, it's about learning foreign languages, you know, reading about other countries and uh, uh, reading about news from other countries. And I think this is where many other countries have still a um, long way to go, uh, particularly the United States where learning foreign languages is not, not really a kind of a custom so that people would learn world languages uh, um, as a systematic way of part of their curriculum. And that's why I think when we begin to educate global citizens in our schools, primary school and uh, secondary schools, I think these things should come before uh, global traveling. There's also the, the green sustainable, sustainable development aspect there that I think we should encourage our people to do things that they can do from home, uh, to do them first before they travel and uh, put the, the uh, additional burden on the environment and the globe. Vivian, I'm going to give you the last question. On, oh, go on, ahead. On, okay. Oh, but I, just, I just wanted to comment on Passy's comment that um, people in Finland have learned from the U.S. And, and uh, simply to say uh, it, that while we've um, I've sort of been focusing on what the U.S. can learn from other countries, what what mirror does it hold up to our system? Um, what does it show us? <clears throat> it's also the case that all of the high-performing systems have spent a lot of time uh, sending people to the U.S. I mean, we do have the largest education research um, activity in the world. People can sometimes you know, question some of the quality of it, but <clears throat> it's, it's uh, enormously generative. We have lots and lots of um, innovation, um, and people come and look at these things and think about how, how they can take it back to their system. What we haven't done is the, is the sort of system part, to build this into a coherent system with common standards and high-quality teachers and equity that serves all children well. But um, in every country, people will tell you how much they've learned from uh, visiting schools and reading um, American research. I think that's a terrific place to finish. I'm going to thank both of you as I turn the time over to Anna now, and I think she'll want to continue to interact with you. But at least from my side, thank you both so much for a very thoughtful conversation. Honor. Thank you, Steve. It's a great thank question. Thank you, Steve. This is Honor from Asia Society, and I just wanted to take a few minutes here at the end on behalf of Asia Society's Partnership for Global Learning um, to say thank you to uh, everyone for attending. Of course, thank you to Steve for hosting, and a special thanks to Posse Salberg and Vivian Stewart for sharing your expertise. Um, in addition to their books, Finnish Lessons, and A World-Class Education, I wanted to invite everyone to uh, see what we have to offer um, in our education resources on the Asia Society website, and in particular, um, in terms of looking at school systems from around the world, I think you might be uh, interested in the work coming out of our Global Cities Education Network. So um, this link, and I'll put the links in the chat as well, um, will take you to an overview of this initiative where you'll find a variety of related reports and videos and so on. And then more generally, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that we have our annual conference coming up this summer in New York City at the end of June. So we invite you uh, to join us for that. Coming soon, we are excited to be launching a new PGL online website, so please stay tuned. And meanwhile, we hope that um, if you haven't already found us, you will uh, take a look at our blog on Education Week, the global learning blog, and connect with us um, in other ways. We have ways that you can do that on Twitter and Facebook and so on. And we hope to see you next week, uh, a week from today, when Steve will interview Andrea Schleicher from the OECD about some of these same issues. So thanks for um, joining us, and thanks to Steve and Posse and Vivian. Thanks, everybody. That was delightful. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Thanks, Honor.